A huge thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hey everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about complex numbers and how they can be used in physics. We'll start by looking at the absolute basics of complex and imaginary numbers, and then apply these to a few areas of physics. So, if you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. Now, if at any point we cover something that you're already familiar with, then check out the timestamps at the bottom of the video player and feel free to skip ahead. Okay, let's start by looking at what an imaginary number is. The imaginary number i is defined as being the square root of negative one. In school, we're often taught that only positive numbers can have a square root. But at some point, someone thought, what if we could find the square root of negative numbers? The imaginary number i was defined as the square root of negative one, and it's only called imaginary because back then it was considered fake or useless. But it's just a name. Anyway, using this simple imaginary number that we've defined, we can write the square root of any negative number. For example, we can find the square root of negative four, because negative four is equal to negative one times four. Then using the rules of thirds or square roots, we can say that the square root of negative four is two times i, the imaginary number. Or the square root of negative seven can be written as i times the square root of positive seven, which is approximately this number here. So that's an imaginary number, something multiplied by this quantity that we're calling i. It doesn't actually fall on the number line that we're used to, but we'll come to that in a moment. In order to get there, we first need to look at how imaginary numbers can be combined with non-imaginary or real numbers. We do this by simply adding together a real number and an imaginary number. For example, five plus two i. This whole thing, a real number added to an imaginary number, is called a complex number. Again, that's just what it's called, doesn't really matter what we call it, as long as we all know what's being discussed. We could call this combination Jeff if we wanted to, but we won't. So let's take a look at how we can combine two Jeff numbers, I mean complex numbers. Let's say we want to find this complex number plus this complex number. Well, we simply sum together the real parts and the imaginary parts separately to give us our final result. Easy. And here's how we can multiply complex numbers together. This will be intuitive if we know how to multiply out brackets with multiple terms. But notice that this first term here gives us a real number. The second and third terms are imaginary because we multiplied an imaginary number by a real one. And this final term has this i squared bit in it. But what is i squared? Well, it's just negative one. So this final term is also real. We can then simplify this by collecting reals and imaginaries together to give us our final answer. So this is how complex numbers work. We can treat each component separately. And there's a reason that I'm saying component. To see what I'm talking about, let's take a look at a way to represent complex numbers in a graphic or diagrammatic way. Firstly, we draw a number line with all our real numbers on it. Zero in the middle, negative numbers to the left, and positive numbers to the right. Now, we said earlier that i, the root of negative one, is not a real number, so it doesn't lie along this number line. We can choose to represent the imaginary number on another axis. We can imagine i lies along this line here. And this value is twice the distance from the origin of our newly forming graph, so this is 2i, and then we've got 3i, and so on and so forth. And of course, we have negative imaginary numbers too. What we've drawn here is known as an Argand diagram, and we can represent any complex number on it. For example, our complex number four plus three i can easily be represented by starting at zero, going four units along the positive real direction, and then three units in the positive imaginary direction. And this point on our diagram then represents the complex number four plus three i. Now, interestingly, we can also represent this same number with a vector or arrow starting at the origin and ending at our point here. This way, each of the parts of our number, the real part and the imaginary part, act like the horizontal and vertical components of the vector. And this is why we can treat each part separately. 
because we treat them as if they're acting in perpendicular directions, the real direction and the imaginary direction in this abstract space of numbers that we've just created. Now, each complex number obviously has its real and imaginary parts, but it can be also described using two different pieces of information. Firstly, we can use the length of the vector drawn here. We can call this the modulus or absolute value of the complex number, and it's easily found using Pythagoras' theorem. The other important defining quantity is an angle. We normally use the angle between the real axis and the complex number vector measured in the anti-clockwise direction. This is just a choice, but usually a very convenient one. This angle, usually labeled theta, is called the argument of the complex number. And just like we can figure out uniquely which complex number someone is talking about if we know its real and imaginary parts, we can do the same if we just know the absolute value and the argument. Because the absolute value tells us how long our vector is starting at the origin, and our argument tells us what angle it has with the real axis. Okay, now this next bit is where we start seeing links with small bits of physics, though it might not seem obvious at first. Let's remember, using trigonometric identities, that the cosine of an angle in a right angle triangle, like this one, is given by the size of the adjacent side, divided by the size or length of the hypotenuse. And so the hypotenuse, which is r, multiplied by the cosine of the argument theta, gives us the real part of the complex number. Then we can do a similar thing with sine. The sine of theta is given by the length of the opposite side to the angle divided by the hypotenuse. So we can say r sine theta is equal to the imaginary part. In other words, we can now say our complex number is given by r times cos theta plus i times r times sine theta. Factorizing the r, we find that this is r cos theta plus i sine theta. This is often really useful in physics because we describe many things using sine and cosine functions, like transverse waves such as light, or the oscillation of a pendulum, or many other such things that you can think of. But here's the thing, this whole bit inside brackets can be written much more compactly using exponential functions. We may be most familiar with the exponential function as representing things that grow more and more quickly over time. But what we specifically call the exponential function is a very interesting one. In its most basic form, its value at every point is equal to the gradient or slope of the function at that same point. Anyway, when combined with complex numbers, it can also be used to very concisely represent sine and cosine functions. More precisely, it turns out that our complex number, r times cos theta plus i sine theta, can be represented as r times e to the power of i times theta. This identity here is known as Euler's identity, and it would take a whole video to discuss properly. I'll also leave some resources in the description below if you want to find out why this identity is true, since it might seem very confusing that an exponential function suddenly looks periodic when we introduce complex numbers into it. The reality is a little bit more subtle, but like I say, resources in the description below, and let me know if you want me to make a separate video on this. But here, let's just assume that this identity works. There are a couple of benefits to this. Firstly, it's the compact packaging. Quite literally, it's shorter and easier to write e to the power of i theta rather than the whole cos theta plus i sine theta every single time. But secondly, when dealing with multiple complex numbers, it's easier to deal with the exponential notation than it is to deal with sines and cosines. For example, when multiplying two complex numbers using the sine and cosine notation, we'd have to do this whole thing, as we've already seen earlier in the video. Whereas with the exponential notation, using the roles of exponentials, we simply add the exponents and get our end result. Much simpler. What we'll look at next takes us closer still to how complex exponentials are used in physics. We often have to represent physical systems with just sines or just cosines. For example, we can describe the oscillation of a mass on a spring over time using a cosine function. What this tells us is that as time passes, the position of the block changes following a cosine form. Now, we know that sines and cosines are included within this complex number form, but actually we just want to work with one of these, usually the real part. 
However, it's often easier just to work with this whole extended complex exponential form, do whatever mathematics we need to do to study the system, and then at the end, take the real part of the result, which essentially just means to read out the real part and ignore everything imaginary. Like I say, this is often easier than just dealing with the cosine function individually and potentially having to multiply and add other functions to this. Another area of physics where this exact same idea can be used is in the study of alternating currents in electric circuits. Often, an alternating power source will output a sinusoidal potential difference or voltage. And this will influence the current or flow of charged particles that get set up in the circuit. If we just have resistors of different kinds in the circuit, then to be honest, it's easier to deal with the sines and cosines, usually because the current in the circuit will have a peak value given by Ohm's law, not technically Ohm's law, check out this video up here if you want to know more, but the voltage and current will be in phase. That's what's important here. What this means is that the peaks and troughs in the current in the circuit occur at the same time as the peaks and troughs in the potential difference or voltage supplied by the power source. However, if we have other components like capacitors and inductors in the circuit, we have to suddenly deal with the fact that the current may not peak at the same time as the voltage. We say that the current and voltage in these particular instances are not in phase or they have a phase difference. This is because of the specific behaviors of capacitors and inductors. By the way, I want to make a video discussing electric circuits in five levels of difficulty, all the way from beginner to advanced. So let me know if you'd be interested in seeing that in the comments down below. The point is though, that once we start dealing with phase differences and actually calculating these phase differences, it often becomes easier to deal with complex exponentials simply because these are mathematically more compact and easier to deal with and then just take the real part like we discussed earlier. So technically the complex part or complex numbers aren't necessary to represent the system mathematically, but their use makes life a lot easier. However, there is one area of physics where complex numbers are absolutely essential in representing the full picture rather than just acting as a mathematical convenience. We are of course talking about quantum physics. In quantum physics, every single system that we study, maybe a single electron, or maybe the proton and electron in a hydrogen atom, or anything else that we could study, can be represented by a wave function. This wave function contains all the information we can know about our system, such as the positions in space in which we're most likely to find our particles if we measure them. And the wave function is inherently a complex function. The complexness of it is very important. Now, there's a slight subtlety about this that I want to quickly mention here. When we make any measurement on the quantum system that we're studying, like for example, looking for the positions of our system's particles, what we directly measure is something to do with the wave function squared, technically the square modulus. This is because the square modulus of the wave function is directly related to the probability of getting a certain measurement result, such as finding one of our particles at this point in space, for example. And when we find the square modulus of the wave function, the complexness actually goes away. We're left with a real number, which makes sense because probability needs to be a real number. You can't have a three I percent chance of finding a particle somewhere in space. So in that sense, the complexness of the wave function is lost. And we may think that the complexness is once again, a mathematical convenience in order to represent quantum wave functions and that it isn't actually significant in terms of the physics. However, this is not true. There are quantum effects that are directly or indirectly impacted by the complex phase of wave functions, which have calculable and measurable indirect effects. One such effect is the Aharonov Bohm effect, which I've discussed in this video up here if you're interested. But to me, it's very cool how complex numbers have an indirect but measurable impact on quantum mechanical systems. Now, before we finish up, I want to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this video, Squarespace. Squarespace gives you a beautiful, powerful online platform from which to create your website. You can build a community on your Squarespace website with a fully integrated commenting system that supports threaded comments, replies, and likes. On top of that, you can easily display posts from your social profiles on your website.
You can also connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members only content. You can manage your members, send email communications and leverage audience insights as well, all on one easy to use platform. So if you're looking to very easily create a crisp, nice looking website, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash path G to get a free trial and to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com forward slash path G. Huge thanks to Squarespace once again for sponsoring this video. And with that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Check out my merch link down below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And finally, I'd like to thank all of my Giga patrons as well as all of my other patrons over on my Patreon page. That's also linked down below if you'd like to support me on there. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon.